Hi, um, I've never done something like this before, so this is a little out of my comfort zone. So bear with me. Um, I don't really have a script for this, I'm just going to do this raw. And uh, so a little introduction. Hi, my name is Carrie. I'm 31, going on 18. <laughs> I know I look a lot younger than I really am. It's a fun problem to have. I was born and raised in Ohio, and I'm still living here. <laughs> I'm interested in like animals, wildlife, and I even got a degree in zoology. And unfortunately, I haven't done much with it yet, but hopefully in the future I can get somewhere with it. But I think that's a lot of millennials' problems <laughs> nowadays. Get a college degree and uh, I can't do anything with this. No one will look at me. But anyway, so yeah, that's what I'm passionate about. I really like animals, learning about them, and which is why I have so many zoo videos and why I have a degree in zoology. So I'm, yeah. <laughs> I like to take nature pictures like flowers and animals. I really enjoy doing that. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, now I'd like to go over how this all started. So April of this year, uh, 2021, I had a period that lasted longer than usual. So, um, like, it's usually around, like, six or seven days. This one was, like, ten days long. And I just thought, maybe my hormones are just a little off this month. Maybe I'm stressed with work. So maybe this was just a one-time hiccup, and I'll wait till next month to see what happens. Well... Later, I had bleeding in between, so I was bleeding and it was not my period, and so that kind of raised a red flag for me. And I'm like, uh-oh, I better get this checked out now. <laughs> so I went ahead and called for an appointment for the um, Ohio State University Gynecological Services to find a doctor. And so I called and they said the soonest they could get me in was October and it was May at the time and I was definitely not going to wait till October. So I asked like, is there a way I can get in sooner? And uh, they told me that my primary care doctor could put in a referral for me since I thought this was kind of an emergency. So I went ahead and called my primary care doctor and so she made the referral. I was able to get a doctor for June and so June comes. I go in, I meet the doctor and she examines me and she didn't find anything odd. But then she did a rectal exam which I was surprised about that. And apparently rectal exams for gynecology are very important because they can feel a lot in there and I didn't know that. So surprisingly she did a rectal exam but they're important. And she felt something. She was like, I'm not sure what this is. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, like I wouldn't know. So she went ahead and she scheduled an ultrasound for me. And so, I remember July, it was July 20th, it was two days before my birthday. So that's when I got the ultrasound. So the next day, July 21st, she goes over the results with me and the ultrasound showed that there was a fibroid in my uterus. So I'm thinking, okay, it's just a fibroid that can be easily, well maybe not easily removed, but <laughs> that can be removed at least. And hopefully that gets my period back to normal. And this will 
be all done. Like I can just get this treated relatively quickly and everything will go back to normal. And so then she was like, I'm, I just want to examine you one more time just to be sure like I didn't miss anything. And so she examined me again and she did the rectal again and she said, I'm still feeling something here and it's not the fibroid. And I'm like, I mean, not out loud, but I'm thinking like, it's not, this is something else. So she was saying like, this is something else. This is not the fibroid. So I'm going to go ahead and schedule you for an MRI to find out what's going on. And so August comes and that's the MRI. So I go ahead and do the MRI, get that done. I have a my chart app. And so I was able to see the results of that of the MRI and the MRI showed that there was a mass in my cervix and it was affecting my ureter but, and it was relatively big mass and I guess it was, it's pushing up against my bladder too. It did feel like that I had to pee more often so it made sense since this mass was hitting my bladder too. Well not hitting it just pushing up against it and so I'm just kind of like a little worried about that <laughs> obviously and so my doctor calls me and she tells me about the mass and how it's um affecting my ureter and it's pushing up against the ureter and in case you don't know the ureter is what connects your kidney to your bladder they also saw that since my ureter was being pushed up against my kidney was not emptying urine all the way so there's like still some like leftover urine and it was swelling my kidney up a bit and so that was concerning and she told me that um they weren't quite sure what this was and like whether it was just a very bad case of endometriosis or if it was cancer. So this doctor went ahead and referred me to a gynecological oncologist because she herself was not comfortable in case like this was cancer. She wasn't comfortable working with it because she's not in that field. So she went ahead and referred me to the gynecological oncologist. And so I go to that doctor in September and we go over just like what we found with the MRI and how they're going to determine what it is. And so I get scheduled for a biopsy like the next week. So it was very quickly that I got. And so they scheduled me for a needle biopsy where they take a needle and aspirate the mass and take cells out and put it under, they put it under a microscope and like other things to figure out what it is. And they also, because of my kidney issue where it wasn't emptying all the way because the mass was blocking the ureter a little bit they went ahead and put in a ureteral stint and what that is is it's a tube that they put in you and the tube goes from your kidney to your bladder and so it kind of like unclogs it I guess <laughs> so like the pee goes in the tube from your kidney into your bladder so it's not like blocked or anything so the day of the biopsy comes, I they put me under anesthesia, so I'm completely out. So I wake up and biopsy's done. I have the stint in me and so I just 
have to wait, obviously, for the results. So, <laughs> I'm sitting waiting. So, my new gynecologist doctor, she's the one that did the biopsy. She calls me and she goes over the results and basically she told me they still didn't know what this was exactly. But they definitely ruled out cervical cancer. It wasn't acting like a cervical or like a uterine cancer so I was thankful for that. But then she said that the cells were acting like lymphoma and I remember being like lymphoma what is that I know I've heard that before and so I google lymphoma and it's it's a cancer of the lymph node so it's still cancer so I'm still concerned about that so but she was telling me that it was acting like lymphoma, but they didn't know 100% if it was lymphoma. And so she went ahead and referred me to a hematologist, since lymphoma is like a blood immune system disease. So she went ahead and referred me to this new doctor, so... I'm going from doctor to doctor to doctor, and so it, that's a little frustrating, but what are you going to do? <laughs> so the hematologist, he calls me on the phone, and we just, he just kind of goes over what they found with the biopsy. So the hematologist goes ahead and he orders me a PET scan, which I've never heard of this before. And so, what they do with the PET scan, they inject you with, like, radioactive material, but it's, like, not super toxic. So they put, like, radioactive material in your vein, and then they give you, like, a contrast. And I can't remember which one's the sugar, but it might be the radioactive material that's the sugar, but, um... Anyway, it's like a special sugar that um, cancer cells will absorb very quickly and so you take the contrast and that's what um, glows on the pictures that the machine takes. And so uh, any cancer cells that are in your body, they, they'll glow on these pictures. That just shows like where in the body these cells are absorbing the sugar. So after the PET scan I go see the doctor for the first time in person. So that day they actually had the results of the PET scan right there. So that was nice. <laughs> Didn't have to wait. So anyway we went over the results and the mass that was in my cervix was glowing and um, so I was kind of expecting that. I already knew there was a mass there but um, luckily that was the only spot that was glowing except um, I guess the heart and the brain absorbed that sugar too so it's normal for like the heart to glow and the brain to glow so I mean that was glowing too so I guess that means those are working properly <laughs> Maybe not the brain so much, but... <laughs> so that mass that was in my cervix was indeed glowing, so... Unfortunately, that suggests that there is cancer there. But um, this hematologist wanted to make, like, for absolute certain, because he said this isn't... This just suggests that it's cancer, but this is not a definitive diagnosis and we want to get a definitive diagnosis and so he went ahead and he wanted to order a second biopsy because um apparently the first one the sample was kind of like crushed a little bit so like when they look under the microscope it's kind of hard to see a little bit like properly like 
the cells because like some of them are like crushed obviously so it's like it's kind of hard to tell what this is <laughs> so um they weren't the best samples and i think that's partly why they weren't a hundred percent sure it was lymphoma even though there was like some cells that suggested it and so he went ahead and with my new gynecologist the gynecological oncologist he went ahead and like called her to have her redo the biopsy so that was a little frustrating just because it's like you want this over so quickly you want a diagnosis just to get this done already but I mean you can't rush things obviously you don't want to misdiagnose something and so November and right now it's November so this is a few weeks ago I had the second biopsy done had to do the anesthesia all over again and it felt worse the second time, honestly. So after this biopsy, a few days later, the hematologist called me and he went over the results and they did indeed confirm that it was large B cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So. I mean, no one ever wants to hear that. But, uh, yeah, I have cancer. So after this confirmation of this diagnosis, um, this scheduled me to meet up with the hematologist to go over treatment plans. So Monday the 29th is when I met the doctor to go over treatment and so they went over that they confirmed it's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, a large B cell and fortunately it's stage one so that's good and they categorized it as stage 1E and E means extranodal and what that means is um, the mass is outside the lymph node system and well that's definitely me. <laughs> so I guess that's a good thing that it's not affecting my lymph nodes yet it's just concentrated in that one area in my cervix so I'm thankful for that. And so the treatment plan is that I'm gonna have three rounds of chemo. After three rounds of chemo, they're gonna give me another PET scan to see if those cancer cells are still there. If they still glow on that, on the screen, you know. And if it looks like that it's gone, then I have one more round of chemo, like just for good measure to make sure everything's really gone if it looks like the mass is gone at that point. I'd be considered in remission after that fourth chemo session. And then they would just check up on me often, make sure it doesn't come back. But um, if they do the PET scan and it looks like it's still there, then they do three more rounds of chemo and then do another PET scan. And then they'll see if that works, the um, six rounds instead of the three. So if it works there, then I believe that's when I would be considered in remission if it's gone after six rounds. But if it's still there after six rounds, then they would consider doing a different kind of chemo and radiation. So the minimum amount would be four total rounds of chemo. So hopefully that works. <laughs> and um, also it's strange because um, they they don't know why but um, they say that um, 
people in stage three and four of lymphoma, when they um, go into remission, then they usually stay in remission and it doesn't come back. Whereas people in stage one and two, when they go in remission the first time, like a few years later, it comes back. And well, I don't want to say unfortunately I'm one. I mean, it's good to be in stage one, obviously, but um, the unfortunate thing is that with lymphoma, stage one and two, it usually comes back and they don't know why. So in addition to the like normal chemo, the IV chemo, I have to get a spinal injection. The reason for this uh, spinal chemo is because um, Usually when the cancer comes back, it's in the nervous system. So like in the brain and like the spinal cord. And so this um, chemo is injected in the spinal cord because regular chemo, there's like a blood brain barrier that regular chemo cannot pass through. And they believe that's why when cancer comes back, in lymphoma it's in the brain because regular chemo does not penetrate that um blood brain barrier which is why they have to directly put a needle in your spinal cord and put in a special chemo medicine that way so i'm not looking forward to that uh i'm not the best with needles i I think it's torture. <laughs> it sounds like torture, but if it means getting better, I will put up with it. So I've had a lot of blood work done, which is a lot of needle poking and anesthesia, you gotta have IV. So as someone who hates getting poked and prodded, that's been difficult for me, but I think for the most part I'm handling it well because, I mean, I guess when you have to, you just do it. As much as I hate being poked and prodded, I'll suffer through the torture to, if it means getting better and healing. And um, as of this recording, it's um, November 30th. So this Friday, which is December 3rd, is my first treatment. And so... That will be the start of my journey. I think I'm handling it pretty well. I think God has given me a piece about this. I mean, no one wants to hear that they have cancer. But as I said, I think God has given me a piece about this and I trust that I can get through this and I can be healed from this. And I'll upload other videos, like more do videos. I don't want this channel just to be all doom and gloom, you know, but um, I just think I need to get my story out and I hope that out of this terrible thing to happen to me, I can make something good come from it. So I hope I can encourage people, maybe if they're going through it, we can go through it together. <laughs> or I can just inspire people that I'm trying to keep good spirits despite this diagnosis. So I hope I can be a good inspiration for people. So that's why I wanted to make this video and uh, start this series. I kind of want to have a record of what I go through and I, I think it'll be good for me too, just like a therapy I guess, <laughs> it's something to help me cope with this and it's like I want that information to be out there. As I learn, I want other people to learn too what it's like to go through this. And so I can like raise awareness for the treatment for lymphoma. So thank you for watching this. Hope people can learn from this experience as 
I am learning from it as well. And um, we'll get through this journey together. So thank you.